Welcome to Discover Health. I'm your host, Dr. Tom Barella. We thank you for watching today. We have a very interesting program that really is around how to get children a good start in life. On the mountain here, we've had several programs that have been related to making sure early childhood starts correctly. We have a First Things First program up here that works for ch children uh, to try to help them get ready for school. But even more importantly is the need to recognize normal children's, our children's normal development. And to do this, we are pleased to have our guest, Jody Gaskill, here this morning. She is the executive director of Northland Therapy. And she has been responsible for making sure early development in children is normal for the past 25 years, you mm -hmm. said, on, on the mountain years. here. Northland mm -hmm. Therapy has been here. Yeah. Jody, thank you for coming to talk to us this yeah. morning. Thank you for and, having me. And um, I know I have used your services as mm -hmm. a pediatrician numerous times. And so Northland Therapy is a mainstay of early childhood um, assessment in, on our community. Why don't you tell us, get started with telling us a little bit about Northland Therapy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, our office is in Sholo, and we service Southern Navajo County. So we service um, Holbrook on down, and we also service the reservation, um, CBQ and um, White River. So White River Reservation. How about north of I-40 on, on the Navajo Reservation? That is, that's growing in beauty. They okay. serve that area. Okay. Yeah, so. we used to back in the day, but it's too expansive. It goes all the way to the border of Utah. Yes. And it was uh, a little much. A lot of driving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the state split it off. Um, yeah. So Southern Navajo County, and we provide in-home services. So we go to the children's homes and work with them. So not only do you have an office setting in Fawnbrook area mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in Cholo, but you also provide home services. That's correct, yeah. So the Arizona Early Intervention Services or AZIP services are all home-based services. We go into the children and families' homes and work with them, and we use a coaching model that helps the parents um, learn how to do these developmental activities with their children to help them along with their development. Wow, so nothing in Apache County. So that is Hummingbird Early Intervention oh, no. in Apache County, and that's Laura Dinelli. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. So, so they also have services mm -hmm. over there, but, but you're strictly in southern Navajo County. Correct. I mean, AZIP is, is statewide. Okay, so AZIP is one program, but you mm -hmm. have other programs at Northland Therapy, too. Correct. So we recently got funding for the Healthy Families um, Arizona program, which we're super excited about, and that started in October. Um, we're just up and rolling. I know you recently interviewed Diane Ruzma for that right. program. And um, we were funded through DCS. We're a DCS program and we're preventative. Um, we help prevent child abuse and build connections between parent and child. And, and that program is mm -hmm. really related to high-risk families, families that feel like they have difficulties or mm -hmm. maybe that's too harsh of a word. Um, just um, to support parents parenting is that correct just families that are kind of you know dealing with some challenges they may have some mental health issues they may have a lot of uh, they could be um, former substance users that are trying to stay clean and um, there's DCS refers a lot of those families they're kind of at risk they just need a support system and so we can go in and kind of support them on, in a preventative nature and, um, and that's important Yes, and we love, well, we love this program, um, but we can get in and see pregnant moms. So we can start when they find out they're pregnant and screen them and assess them, and if they meet the risk factors, they can join into the program and they get a family support specialist that comes and visits them in home. Well, we'll direct people to one of our other shows, which yeah. was uh, related to Diane being here, mm -hmm. and she gave an excellent description of how she yeah. can help uh, families be healthy. Mm -hmm. And you have a third program, I know, th um, at uh, Northland Therapy. So that we do employment services for individuals that qualify for vocational rehabilitation services through D DES. So we're a provider for DES to do supported education. Um, we do rehabilitation instructional services to promote social and communication skills. Um, anything that individuals would need 
to get ready to get a job, find a job, and keep a job. So lots of foundational skills to help them get ready. For, for people, people that have a difficult time getting a full-time so-called normal job. Correct. Um, and the goal is to get them to work competitively. Um, so some of our clients get referred just to Division of Developmental Disabilities, or some of them may go on to get our services okay. to work competitively. Wow. Okay. So. so a broad spectrum of services. Mm -hmm. But I want to kind of focus today on AZIP, okay. Arizona Early Intervention Program, <laughs> because that's been um, a really valuable service for our community for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. As a pediatrician, um, you know, I'm there for screening mm -hmm. for disabilities, but I don't have the skills or nor the training to do what you guys do. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about AZIP. That's okay. the acronym that we're all used to. Yeah. Um, who's, who's AZIP for? So AZIP are for children and fam families with children that have significant delays. So in the state of Arizona, it's a 50% delay in one or more areas of development, or the child could have an established condition such as um, epilepsy, autism, cerebral palsy, or some you know cognitive delays. And um, so, so the fifty percent, though, mm -hmm. in in my experience, has been a significant issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I why agree. don't you? So why don't you give us an example of what maybe a fifty percent delay really means? So that well, that's where we get into all the assessment and evaluation okay. of the children. Um, to assess a child, we use the ASQ um, or the ASQ social emotional to look at their skills and in all ASQ the different stands areas. For? Um, you probably don't remember. Oh my gosh. Wait, hang on. I wrote down my acronyms in case I forget. ASQ. Oh, I forget. Can we come back to that question? <laughs> we aren't going to come back to it, but I was going to try to explain it. Go ASQ. on. Go on. So, but it is one of the techniques that you it's use. questionnaire. I can tell you that. Okay. Um, yeah. And so we go through and look at all the areas of development. So there's uh, adaptive, cognitive, communication. There's motor skills that we look at, fine and gross motor skills, and then the social emotional skills or behavioral skills. So we look at all those areas, and if they score low on that screener, which is just kind of a down and dirty assessment, then they would move on to evaluation. Doing it. And for that, we use the DACI, or <laughs> Developmental Assessment of Young Children, I can tell you that acronym. Um, and then that looks more in depth. And so if we get into the evaluation piece of the program, then um, a developmental specialist and a therapist would go. There would be two evaluators who would go and look at the child. So when, when we, one thinks about development and one thinks about delays, and mm -hmm. you use a number of 50% delay, mm -hmm. what does that really mean in terms of milestones? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, as a pediatrician, I'm used to dealing with milestones. Mm -hmm. And let's say I expect a child to be walking by the time they're 15 months old. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. A 50% delay would mean that a child maybe is three years old and not walking. I know it doesn't go like that. Exact, yeah, not exactly like that. But it would be, you know, at two or two and a half, if that child's not walking, we would be very concerned. Um, you know, if they should be um, sitting up by six months, if they're not sitting up by 12 months, we're very concerned. I mean, huh. that. So essentially delay. you use a normal set of milestones mm -hmm. that children are supposed to, to achieve mm -hmm. and then go through an evaluation. Correct. And it starts with a questionnaire? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you ask the parents, uh -huh. what does your kid do? Yeah. What does your kid mm -hmm. not do? Now, I did, we like to see it. We love to see the child um, you know, in action also, but it is a parent input survey. And a lot of the agencies use the ASQ and the ASQ um, social emotional and, and and I know we as as physicians um, all walks of uh, physicians that deal with children use a Denver developmental screening mm -hmm. test as a mm -hmm. an indicator when parents come in but our you know our time with parents is limited so other than asking them and maybe making some cursory um, examinations uh, of the children for physical problems we really don't have that skill set that that you have Right, and as you said, you don't have the time either, so right. that's our job, so that's where we can come in and really get, you know, and we can see them in their environment too because we go to the home so we could see kind of the bigger picture of what's going on. Like sometimes um, parents don't have 
carpeting or good flooring. And so they're, they're saying, well, we're not putting our kids on the floor. They're not getting the tummy time or they're not oh. getting the time to crawl around. They're in a walker or something. So we can really get in the home and check all of that out. Our, Look at the bigger picture. And, and the ability to slip on hard floors versus carpeted mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and stuff yeah. along those lines. And you get, also get to observe how they're feeding their children, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, um, so how do people get to AZIP? How do they get to you? Yeah, so there's, um, they just call our office. I mean, it's super simple. Like, anyone can refer. Um, DCS refers to us, any kind of agency, anyone. They just call the office and talk to Judy, and she answers <laughs> the phone and takes the referral. And qualifying for AZIP services? Um, so again, it's back to the 50% the developmental delay. But the initial assessment? The initial assessment. It, mm -hmm. You say anybody can call you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does it cost? It, <laughs> they're free, services are free. <laughs> yeah, they're funded by the state, although you know, everyone wants to be the payer of last resort, and so does AZIP. So if you get into therapy services, if you do qualify and get into services, then we would want to utilize private insurance or public insurance public. for therapies. But other than that, service coordination, um, the assessment, the evaluation, all of that is funded by AZIP. So that's an important distinction, that mm -hmm. the evaluation is free, mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. matter what your situation. Correct. So Correct. if a parent suspected that their child wasn't developing normally, wasn't doing the things on time, mm -hmm. they could just call your office and you would schedule essentially a home assessment, mm -hmm. and ha home yeah. assessment, and you would go in. And at that point, you could tell the parent, because you've really gone through both the questionnaire and the formal you know, the formal assessment mm -hmm. that you would have to do. Is this all done in one visit? No, so that's a good question. We would go, we would call them on the phone after we get the referral and discuss with them some of their concerns on the phone and set up a time to meet in person. Then we would go out and do the screening piece. And that would be a service coordinator. So we could just okay. go out and kind of do the, if, if the AS, even if the ASQ has been done and sent to us, we still like to review it with the parents, make sure nothing's been missed. And then if they, if the, you know, if the child doesn't screen into the program, then we send them, you know, we might refer them back to Healthy Steps just to check on their development or a library program or, you know, whatever kind of community resources. Um, if they do screen into us, then the home visitor that's out there gets with another therapist and then schedules an evaluation if the parents would like to move forward. Okay, so they, you would, the screening would kind of direct you towards what kind of therapy mm -hmm. you might need. Mm -hmm. So, and, and what kinds of therapists do you have? So we have the, the core, our core team is a service coordinator slash developmental specialist. So we use uh, it's called a dual role in this area because okay. we're rural. So they're both. Okay. Um, and then we have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Okay. And, and the, the kinds of things maybe a physical therapist would approach in early childhood mm -hmm. would be? So in our coaching model, in our team-based coaching model, um, we're all considered early interventionists and we cross quite a bit. I mean, there's quite a bit of overlap and, and these girls, you know, our physical therapist has been with us for over 18 years, oh. you know, yeah. Our <laughs> occupational therapist has been with us for seven or eight years and our speech therapist has been with us for a long time also. So they cross over quite a bit. Um, but typically the physical therapist would look at gross, gross motor skills. Those yeah. are big muscles. Mm -hmm. The large skills, the sitting for, for, for children, the sitting, rolling, the sitting, rolling the crawling. Over, yeah. Walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and occupational therapist? That would be more the fine motor and adaptive. Um, so the small skills with the hands, grasping items, picking up small items off of the table. Um, lot, occupational therapists can also do some feeding. Um, just real kind of functional, and they very much overlap. And then speech, speech is speech. Speech is speech, mm -hmm. but that's also feeding too. It, it, yes, yes, that's correct. It, it's, uh, okay, mm -hmm. so, so a full spectrum of services. Now I'm gonna ask you one other question. We didn't prepare you for this one, ah, so we'll okay. hit this one. <laughs> uh, a lot of, now in the news, a lot of concern about autism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have that evaluation capability also? Yes, so uh, Barb McMasters, who is a 
developmental specialist slash service coordinator on our staff at um, Northland, awesome. who's been with us for I don't even know how many years now. I didn't. A long time. Too. I don't have her long, longevity memorized, but um, she is trained in the ADOS, which is because I knew I would forget this Autism Diagnostic Observation Scale. So she is an ADOS. Uh, she, she's licensed to do that. To do, so she's mm -hmm. licensed to actually do this. Mm -hmm. And 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 I know this is a difficult issue in young children because isn't there an age cutoff for AZIP and your services, early childhood mm -hmm. services? Yes. So at three, no matter what, at three, that's the cutoff for AZIP. So AZIP is mm -hmm. gone. So mm -hmm. if your child is over three and needs and, and three and a half and you think the child need, has developmental issues, where do they go in our community? So I would go to their local school district child find. That's where I would recommend. Also talk to their um, pediatrician or their family doctor. Um, they could also apply for um, services with DDD. Division of Developmental Disabilities. Yeah, it's important to get the distinction of starting early through AZIP, mm -hmm. and then several years ago there was a mandate that the school system had to start evaluating kids over the age of three mm -hmm. to for developmental issues in mm -hmm. terms of getting them ready for for school and stuff like that. Yeah, and so children who are already in our program, if the parents want to put them into preschool, we can apply, we work with them and we help them transition from our services into the public school services where they can continue with their therapy and um, educational services. Okay, and so the same thing is true for autism, although our resources up here are quite limited mm -hmm. for early mm -hmm. childhood in autism. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you guys have a therapy program for children who have pervasive developmental disorder, which is what autism falls under? So as far as AZIP is concerned, we don't distinguish those children any differently. Oh. They, all, they all have developmental delays and we go in and we work with the family and we write the individual family service plan and we see you know, what the family wants to work on and we support that. So their program you know, could look like whatever the family's, you know, if the family's really concerned about communication skills, then we would focus on that. Okay, just just an interesting thing, so that parents know that that it's okay to come to you, mm -hmm. and and it's okay to be told that your kid is okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is. I mean, it's good news. That's yeah. it, it, it is in <laughs> fact good news. Yeah. So let's go through uh, something else. Um, you know, nowadays, um, and I know you have an additional therapy besides the three that you talked about. You have music therapy too. Mm -hmm. And so I suspect a lot of our audience probably doesn't understand music therapy as your host does not understand it well. <laughs> but I know that it's very effective. Mm -hmm. yeah. So who responds to music therapy? So just about everyone responds to music therapy. Um, so my undergrad is in music therapy and actually I don't have any music therapists employed with me right now. I used to. Um, but we've kind of shifted in some different directions sure. of late. Um, but music is just a, like a wonderful way to reach if, any age, really, but children especially. Um, so if we had that child that was um, speech and language delayed, using songs would be a really good way to build vocabulary, mm. to just promote you know, them making sounds and to promote their expressive language, to kind of focus in on articulation. Um, vocal inflection, whatever needed to happen at an early age, music is um, just a really good way to engage them and to motivate them. I guess that's the, the two main things about music that's Songs. Mm -hmm. So you teach them to sing songs and they try to follow the words of songs and, mm -hmm. and stuff. Sure. Like a therapist, if a child is having trouble with their frontal sounds, like we may come in with some songs or even songs that we make up that just focus on whatever sound a child is having trouble with. And then they get that repeated exposure um, and just the repeated practice of that sound through music. And it's highly engaging and highly motivating. So, Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's just like speech therapy mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. songs. So mm -hmm. probably hard rock music wouldn't work. <laughs> Well, now if you're wanting to exercise and, and to generate some motor movements, I mean the the grinding the beat, beat might beat be, mo you know, it just depends on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I didn't. I didn't ever do that. I, I know there are other therapies that we don't have um, that have access to up here, and we had talked a little bit about horse therapy, mm -hmm. which is something that essentially is used 
in in larger communities um, to promote balance. Mm -hmm. I know that part of of maybe uh, physical therapy is using the big balls to to teach kids to to balance control. Mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm guessing because I'm not a, a physical yeah. therapist and and stuff along those lines, mm -hmm. and and stuff like that. So. Um, basically, you have all the services for the for the children, um, and and you do the assessments, and you can um, refer them. Now, when they leave you, is there are there services in the transition period for mm -hmm. all of these things up here now? Yeah, so again, the school districts, like you said earlier, are required to pick up the children at the age of three, and a lot of people don't know that, but they're required to offer preschool from three to five. Um, for children who have been identified. So if they're in our program, they're already identified, they're likely to qualify for public preschool, although it's not guaranteed. So we would help them with that whole, it's called the and, transition process. And we have special preschool up here, I understand, through head, special pre, Head Start mm -hmm. has a special. So families can, yeah, they can choose Head Start. Um, whatever school district they live in, they can choose that school. Some families choose to just send their um, children to Montessori or to a private school, and we can help them with that transition also. Wow. So it's really important for people to recognize if they think their child has, has any difficulties, there are resources. Mm -hmm at least for evaluation, that don't cost them anything. That's okay. correct. So let's go on to voc vocational rehab. Just okay. want to say a couple things. And, and, and how do people get to you for vocal, voc, voc rehab is the, the term. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they get to you for that? Do they get referred for you for the school system? So first, so the key piece is they have to go to the Sholo DES office first. Okay. Because then the case managers that work over there, the um, voc rehab counselors, they do the whole intake process. They do the eligibility, and they make them eligible. Then when they meet with the clients or the individuals, then they can decide if they need further services. So then they refer out to us. So that's where the funding comes from. So for that program, they have to go to the Sholo DES office first. And they have to qualify for mm -hmm. the Department of Developmental Disabilities? No, for RSA, Rehabilitation Services Administration. Okay. That, it's not, it's separate from DDD. It's separate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and, and then And then the services, are, once again, are in their home? So, so for that program, no. We do go to clients' homes if they have, um, just, I have one gentleman that I see that's, um, He's a wheelchair. He uses a wheelchair. It's hard for him to get around, so I go to his home and see him. But um, for the most part, we either meet him in the community, maybe at Northland Pioneer College if they're going to school there, or they meet at our office. And but yeah, but those individuals would, um, the expectation is if they're going to be competitively employed, that they have some means of transportation. They either drive themselves or they use the, the, the bus or um, they walk or ride a bike or whatever. Okay, and there are other programs in the community for voc vocational rehab also? Um, so are there service providing agencies? Yes. There are a couple other agencies that have statewide contracts that come out of Phoenix. Okay. So they'll have, they won't necessarily have an office up here like we do because we're local, but they'll have just a provider. So there is, there is client choice, individuals can choose. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna finish Okay. by asking you questions about the new direction that you're going. Okay. You're, you're going mm -hmm. and how that might blend into the services that you so extensively provide for the community. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're getting involved with now, the mental health issues. Yeah, so I recently was preparing for empty nest syndrome when my youngest left to go to college, so I decided to go back and get uh, my master's in mental health counseling. It's just I've always been interested in that. Um, so I completed that, and I'm working on my licensure under supervision with Sholo Schools. So because I can't get supervision at Northland, right. there's no one to supervise me. <laughs> um, Sholo Schools has been awesome in working with me. And um, anyway, so I'm working there as a mental health counselor. Um, this will be my second uh, school year. So are you going to try to incorporate this into the younger children when you complete your licensure? You know, I haven't got that far yet. Um, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing at the schools also. I work, I'm at Nicholas Schools, third, fourth, and fifth grade, and then I also work sixth, seventh, and eighth at the junior high, so I see a lot of those children. So um, once you finish all this training, mm -hmm. you, I'm sure with all the things, including healthy families, mm -hmm. 
that that might be uh, an important adjunct to the Healthy Families program that you have. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, it, it, it mm -hmm. seems to have that skill, although I know Diane has some of those skills, maybe mm -hmm. not maybe yeah. not along the same lines that you're going to receive training for. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like it sounds like Northland th our therapy is still on the move. We're still on the move. Yes. And, and you can't stand down. still. I am, just I am goes summarily by impressed by the number of referrals. I had no idea mm -hmm. that, that, that that great of a proportion and people are concerned, really are concerned about mm -hmm. young children. Yeah. And I think the most important thing is there's no bad referral. Like there is no bad referral. Even if we just go in and assess, I mean, that's, I've seen that be a really neat service in and of itself because parents can get um, information on, oh, well, he is a little bit delayed here. Maybe I can do these activities to help him. So I'm, it's a super good service. You're certainly Im I'm impressed. And we're out of time. Okay. It went faster than we thought it would. And I would say to our audience that you heard it here that if you have any concerns about your early childhood development of grandchildren, uh, your own children, that you have a resource that you can get early and free from Northland Therapy. And I'm gonna thank Jody again for taking time out today to talk to us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching.